This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. The Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging is committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through research, professional training, patient care, and community service. As a nonprofit organization at the University of California San Diego School of Medicine, our research and educational outreach activities are made possible by the generosity of private donors. It is our vision that successful aging will be an achievable goal for everyone. To learn more, please visit our website at aging.ucsd.edu. Welcome to the Sam and Rose Stein Institute for Research on Aging's public month monthly um, lecture series. Those of you I haven't had the chance to meet, my name is Danielle Glorioso, and I'm the Director of Research and Development at the Stein Institute. At the Stein Institute, we're committed to advancing lifelong health and well-being through community outreach, training, and research. This public lecture series is an example of the community outreach that we do. For those of you who have been attending for a long time, you know that this public monthly series has been going on for over 20 years now for free. Um, this series has been offered through the generosity of private donors. And if you appreciate the lectures that we provide, please consider making a tax-deductible charitable donation to the Stein Institute at aging.ucsd.edu. Tonight, I'm thrilled and honored to introduce a colleague of mine, Dr. Stephen Thorpe. He's the program director of the post-traumatic stress disorders clinical team at the VA San Diego Healthcare System, and he serves as the associate chief of psychotherapy unit in the Center of Excellence for Stress and Mental Health. Dr. Thorpe is a licensed clinical psychologist specializing in assessments and empirically supported psychotherapies for PTSD. He's particularly interested in treating older adults with PTSD and adapting new technologies to enhance psychotherapy outcomes. He's nationally renowned and we are thrilled to have him here tonight. So please welcome Dr. Stephen Thorpe. Hi everyone, thank you all for coming out. Uh, thanks for the introduction, that was very nice. Um, so I am gonna be talking about PTSD and post-traumatic growth uh, in older adults, and uh, it's a, a topic I'm, I'm passionate about, and I, I really appreciate all of you coming out. Thank you. Um, so uh, first off, I wanna acknowledge uh, my mentors and the sponsors of this research, the people who pay for, for the research uh, to be done, and my, my team, uh, without which uh, none of this would happen. I've got a great team. So I'll talk a little bit about what PTSD is in general, the definition of PTSD, then particularly what PTSD is in older adults and how it's a little different. Um, I'll talk about a psychotherapy trial that we finished and another uh, a larger trial that we actually just uh, wrapped up, and uh, then tell you about some other randomized control trials that we, um, that we have ongoing. Uh, towards the, the tail end of the talk tonight, I'm going to talk about post-traumatic growth, uh, and post-traumatic growth is a relatively new concept, uh, which, I'll, which I'll tell you about more. Uh, and then finally, I'll tell you about some of the future directions that we're thinking about for this research. Uh, PTSD can be uh, caused by exposure to a, a whole number of traumatic events, and those can include things like combat, uh, incarceration, uh, and that could include uh, prisoners of war or Holocaust victims, uh, survivors of the Holocaust, uh, crime victimization, including assault or rape or elder abuse, uh, natural or man-made disasters, uh, accidents uh, such as car accidents, uh, and a, a newer area of research is sudden um, life-threatening illness like heart attacks, uh, myocardial infarctions, or acute respiratory distress syndrome. Um, there is some evidence that that can cause PTSD as well. Uh, the definition of PTSD is, uh, is unusual in a few different ways. One is that it's a relatively new disorder in the Diagnostic and Statistical uh, Manual that, that we use for um, psychiatric disorders. 
Um, and by relatively new, I mean it's only been around since 1980. And it was put in the DSM uh, really under pressure from the Vietnam era veterans who uh, uh, collectively shared this grouping of symptoms and said there's something going on here, it's not just us, there's something that's not met uh, through criteria of depression or other anxiety disorders or something unique to this. Uh, so it's a relatively new disorder. Um, and uh, it's unusual in that it's one of the few disorders that's defined by an environmental event. There's something that happened in the world that caused this disorder. If you look at depression, if you look at other anxiety disorders, other disorders in the DSM, they don't have this explicit, explicitly in the definition that we know the cause and you have to have this cause uh, to have PTSD. So in this case, um, the traumatic event is defined by intense fear or horror or helplessness in response to uh, what is usually a life-threatening event um, to oneself or to one's loved one. And, and uh, uh, we certainly know that people can obtain PTSD from hearing about something awful that happened uh, to a loved one. So for example, if I got a, a phone call about my son being a, in a serious accident, uh, that potentially could cause PTSD. Um, uh, and certainly if people experience these events directly. Um, and, and actually, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, they released the new DSM, the new um, uh, book of definitions uh, for psychiatric disorders, and changed the definition slightly so that now it's not, no longer required uh, to have this intense fear, or horror, or helplessness uh, in response to that event. And the reason they changed it uh, is because it didn't really matter in terms of the prevalence rates and because many of the veterans that we see coming home now don't have those responses uh, when they're in the middle of combat. They might feel completely numb during the event. They might feel really angry during the event. Uh, and so this didn't really apply. So they took that out and they changed a few other things in the definition a couple of weeks ago. Um, so um, the, the other kind of primary symptoms of PTSD are re-experiencing symptoms or sometimes called reliving symptoms. Uh, and these are things like nightmares. So people keep uh, having really bad dreams about the event that happened or having flashbacks, so while they're awake, they actually feel like they're back uh, experiencing that event, whether it's combat or assault or a car accident, uh, and often lose time and lose a sense of place while they're doing that. Um, and then most commonly intrusive thoughts, so while they're trying to do their work or while they're raising their kids, uh, they keep having thoughts about this event. The second big cluster of symptoms uh, includes both avoidance and numbing symptoms, uh, and those are symptoms like uh, not wanting to talk about what happened, not, not wanting to think about what happened, um, and feeling emotionally numb even when uh, a person doesn't want to. So a lot of the veterans that I work with uh, here uh, say that they, uh, for example, would go to a funeral for a friend and wouldn't, wouldn't be able to feel sadness, wouldn't be able to cry even though they knew that they felt loss uh, about this friend. Um, it wouldn't be able to feel love for their children is another uh, really common complaint. Um, the, the last of the major uh, clusters is called hyperarousal, and this includes things like hypervigilance, so uh, always being on guard. So a lot of my veterans who have PTSD, uh, if they were to walk in this room, would immediately scan all of you and look for a threat, uh, and they would immediately scan for exit so that they can get out of here if they needed to. Uh, and that's just part and parcel of PTSD is that people are scanning the environment for threat at all times, which, uh, as you can imagine, is exhausting. All of us do that sometimes. If we're walking out into a parking lot at night, for example, we might check our surroundings. Uh, but imagine doing that all of the time. It, it's distracting and it takes a lot of energy to do that. Um, PTSD has to, these symptoms have to last for at least one month. Uh, three months or longer is considered chronic PTSD. And like all psychiatric disorders, it has to result in uh, functional impairment or distress. Uh, the lifetime prevalence rates uh, of PTSD are interesting in a number of ways. Uh, you can see uh, from this graph um, that there are different rates for men and for women, for example. And so this uh, has rates by uh, the type of traumatic event. And you can see uh, that in green we have, uh, for men, the likelihood of experiencing that event during their lifetime. And then if they have experienced the event, uh, the likelihood of obtaining PTSD. And you see the thing, same for women here. Um, so for natural disaster, these are somewhat moderate rates. For physical attack, somewhat moderate. For combat, uh, there were no data for women at the time. Of course, we know that that's uh, rapidly changing for, for a number of reasons. Uh, but at the time, for men uh, to experience combat was uh, around 7%. But if they had experienced combat, the rates of PTSD were quite high, almost 40%. Uh, 
Uh, you can see this uh, huge differential for uh, sexual assault or rape as well. Only a few men had reported experiencing sexual assault, but those who had had very high rates of PTSD and the same pattern for, for women. Uh, a lower rate experienced it, but if they had experienced it, the rates of PTSD were quite high. Uh, you also see in this uh, final section uh, the chance of experiencing any traumatic event and whether or not they uh, develop PTSD because of that. And you can see that the rates of uh, experiencing these events is actually quite a bit higher in men, uh, almost twice as high uh, in some uh, samples. And so, uh, so men, uh, for a variety of reasons, are more likely to experience these. Again, uh, men are more likely to serve in combat. However, women are more likely to develop PTSD and there are whole books written about this. We don't know exactly why yet. Uh, one theory is that uh, women are more likely to experience interpersonal traumas, which certainly is true, uh, and that there's higher rates of PTSD associated with that. Uh, one of the interesting things there is that the reports that we're seeing now from men and women coming back from combat experiences is that the rates of PTSD are about the same. So if the trauma type is the same, we might see the same rates. Now I'm going to talk about uh, the importance of PTSD among older adults and the prevalence in that population. Uh, we know that PTSD is linked to suicide, uh, and we know that uh, suicide is highest among older adults already, so older adults with PTSD are even more vulnerable to that. Um, and we know that older adults with PTSD uh, have much, uh, you know, many more problems with uh, physical functioning, uh, including hypertension, diabetes, tachycardia, ulcers, almost every system in the body is affected by PTSD negatively. And that's been shown in many, many studies. Um, we did a, a review of all of the published uh, papers on PTSD uh, to review uh, how many had, had focused on older adults and how many had focused on children. We found about 10,000 articles um, since 1980. Only 2% of them focused on older adults, which is very striking. Uh, it's unbalanced in terms of our population, and about 16% focused on children. So, so that tells you how little is out there on older adults with PTSD. Most of the data that we do have uh, come from veterans of World War II and the Korean conflict, uh, survivors of the Holocaust, and survivors of, of uh, natural and man-made disasters. We know very little about older adult survivors of sexual assault uh, and other crimes, including car accidents or the veterans who are returning from the current wars. Uh, there, there's some reason to believe that older adults might be protected from PTSD in some ways, or that they might have lower rates of PTSD. Uh, and these have been talked about in the literature, but, but again, not studied very well. One is that older adults have had a lifetime of learning to cope with things. So it, it, when negative events happen, older adults have been around longer and learned to deal with that uh, more than younger adults have. So they've obtained wisdom in that way. Um, and there's actually, a, a, there has been a big debate in the field about uh, whether or not prior traumatic events are going to inoculate someone or make somebody more vulnerable to future traumas. So if you had something bad happen to you in the past, are you going to be stronger because of that? Did it make you stronger? Or uh, did it make you more vulnerable in some way? And the data overall show that it depends on the severity of the event. So if you experienced something earlier in life that was uh, relatively uh, minor, uh, then it actually can prepare you better for the next time you face uh, an event like that or even a different kind of stressful event. Uh, however, if it was a very severe traumatic event, it could make you more vulnerable to uh, similar events. Uh, so, uh, so there's a, a lot of study about that in the field in general. We know that religious practices are more common among older adults and that could lead to uh, better coping for PTSD. Uh, it's been suggested that older adults are less likely to be confronted with reminders that they're out in the world less or exposed to things out in the world less. I'm not uh, convinced of that. Uh, certainly uh, among the older adults that I work with, uh, they're confronted with all kinds of reminders. Uh, so those are some potential protective factors. There's also some, some potential vulnerability factors among older adults. Uh, and those include uh, potential cognitive impairment, uh, decreased mobility. So if they can't get around, they aren't as free. They, that might remind them of the traumatic event. Uh, physical frailty or complex medical problems, uh, impaired self-care, diminished sensory capabilities. Uh, a lot of the veterans that I work with have trouble hearing, uh, which actually all by itself can lead to hypervigilance, uh, and in extreme cases, paranoia, because you can't hear what people are, are saying or what they're laughing at, for example. Uh, so that can be a, a big problem. And then there are environmental factors as well, including retirement, uh, financial limitations, and the loss of identity in general. 
uh, widowhood or loss of other friends, loss of social support. Uh, you're no longer busy raising your family, so you have more time on your hands. Uh, changes in housing, of course, is a, a radical change. And then polypharmacy, you know, we know that many of the veterans that, that we treat and civilians as well are on many, many medications. And there are very few studies uh, that look at the interactions even uh, between two different medications, much less uh, 15 medications like a lot of the folks that I work with. So all of these could potentially lead to greater rates of PTSD. So given all that, uh, think about what, what you might find if you looked at rates of PTSD in older adults versus younger adults. Here's what we have found, uh, is that in terms of exposure to traumatic events, it's actually more likely that older adults have been exposed to traumatic events, which makes sense because they're older. They've been around longer. They've had more of a chance to be exposed to traumatic events. So uh, between 69 and 86% of older adults have been exposed uh, in community settings. Uh, and that compares to about 55% in the general population, if you remember back to that, that chart that I showed you earlier. Uh, the lifetime PTSD prevalence uh, rate among older adults compared to about 7% in the general population uh, has ranged between about 2.5% and 4.5% among older adults. Uh, this was a, a large study who looked at people who had been exposed to at least one traumatic event, and they broke it down by age, which is unusual for studies to do this, so I'm always glad when they do. Uh, and what you see here, again, is that uh, those who are 65 and older had a lower rate compared to the other age groups. So there is some evidence that older adults may be protected or may have obtained uh, wisdom or there might be something else going on uh, physiologically. Uh, the prevalence in, uh, in community samples um, are, are about 7% uh, and about 3.5% uh, for uh, older adults but they're higher in uh, patient samples, and that's true for veterans as well. About 3.5% uh, of veterans have had PTSD, but those seen in um, either medical or psychiatric clinics have a rate that's much higher, 30 to 50%. Uh, the rates are even higher for those who have survived the Holocaust or those who are former prisoners of war. Um, we also know that the population is aging rapidly. There was a huge study done by Kolka and his colleagues uh, of uh, about half of the million uh, Vietnam era veterans. And they found that at that time, uh, uh, you know, many, many uh, experienced uh, traumatic events uh, through combat and developed PTSD. And the current age of the Vietnam era uh, veterans is about 65 right now. So they're all moving into older adulthood. Um, there are high rates of PTSD for uh, adults who are exposed to traumatic events in later life too. And most of this research uh, is looking at old, uh, adults who are exposed during natural disasters, so landslides, things like that. And they find that uh, the rates are 60% or higher in those samples. Uh, we know that prevalence might vary by culture. And, uh, and this slide shows that. And so you can see here that this isn't looking at rates of PTSD. This is looking at number of symptoms of PTSD. But it gives you uh, a sense of the differences among cultures. So if you look at uh, the data from Mexico, you can see that the rates don't vary very much according to age. If you look at the rates in the US, it looks like rates go down with age, which is, as most of the data I've shown you, uh, that would su suggest that. However, if you look at uh, the data from Poland, for example, you see that the rates go up, which makes a lot of sense given uh, all the events in the early 20th century. Um, so we, we can't assume that most of these data, which are coming from the United States, will apply to all countries and all cultures. Uh, there are some uh, symptoms that are different in older adults compared to younger adults. Uh, avoidance and estrangement from others may increase with age. Uh, survivor guilt and dissociation may actually go down with age. Uh, and uh, from the studies that uh, have looked at older adults exposed in later life, uh, they showed more hyperarousal, preoccupation with the event, avoidance, sleep disturbance, and crying spells compared to middle-aged adults, but, but fewer re-experiencing symptoms. So there are some differences between older and younger adults in terms of how they present with their symptoms. I'm going to talk about treatments for PTSD now, um, and, I'll, and I'll highlight those that have focused on older adults. Uh, in general, uh, very few medication studies have uh, focused on older adults. Uh, there's only a couple, actually. Uh, in general, for PTSD, uh, a class of medications, which are antidepressants, uh, have been found to be the first line of, of uh, pharmacotherapy for PTSD. So this class is called SSRIs. Uh, 
Um, and they work fairly well for reducing the symptoms of PTSD. Again, not studied very well in older adults. Um, there are some uh, data that support other classes of antidepressants. Uh, benzodiazepines are the most widely prescribed medication for uh, PTSD, and benzodiazepines uh, are an anti-anxiety drug, so they help people uh, relax in the short term. Uh, unfortunately, um, they don't work very well in the long term, at least from the data that we have now, and, and there have been, again, uh, no studies uh, focused on older adults with benzodiazepines. Uh, also, we know that benzodiazepines can uh, lead to addiction. They can lead to higher rates of falling uh, among older adults, uh, cognitive problems among older adults. So it's not a great, it's certainly not a recommended treatment for PTSD in general. Uh, a relatively uh, newer area of study is on prazosin, which is actually a drug that's been around for a long time. Uh, it was developed to treat high blood pressure, and then accidentally they found out that it helped to reduce the frequency of nightmares among people who had uh, a lot of nightmares. Uh, so it was this accidental discovery that uh, has actually been really beneficial to, to many people with PTSD. Uh, so we prescribe that quite commonly now. I did a big review of all the studies of psychotherapy for PTSD in older adults uh, probably uh, eight years ago. I started that review, and I thought that there would be a very rich literature on this because we have all these older adults who've experienced combat throughout the uh, years, uh, it, not to mention a, a whole variety of other traumatic events. Uh, it turned out that there were only seven peer-reviewed psychotherapy studies of older adults with PTSD, uh, and they used a variety of different psychotherapies. The modal sample size was one, so that means in general these studies looked at one person and, and tracked them. This is not the best kind of study, of course. It, it, it might be informative in some ways, uh, and it has in some ways, but it's very limited. Uh, exposure therapies are the most studied in the general population, and I'll tell you a little bit more about one of those uh, therapies later. But exposure therapies have people usually uh, talk about something over and over again, in this case the traumatic event. Um, and go out and do things out in the world that they've been afraid of doing since being exposed to a traumatic event. Uh, so we, they have them do those things over and over again. Uh, those therapies work really well for PTSD. They, they work at reducing the symptoms for many people. Uh, they don't have uh, intense PTSD symptoms after going through the treatment, and we followed them out now for, um, for many years. Uh, however, in the literature, even though there weren't uh, good studies out there looking at ex exposure or other things, uh, there was an argument that older adults wouldn't be able to handle intense exposure. Um, and the, the argument was that cognitively they were too frail, physically they were too frail, and these are intensive treatments. Um, and that didn't sit very well with me because, um, because this is the best treatment we have to offer, because there's no data uh, saying one way or the other if this is true. And so, so we did a, a small study to see if this, this was actually supported. So we did this small study, which was published I think last year, um, and uh, this was a study of older male veterans who had PTSD from military traumas, mostly from combat, uh, funded through uh, Dr. Jesty's uh, T32 fellowship. And the idea was to test whether we could recruit people to the study, whether people were willing to take part in these studies, uh, whether we could assess PTSD well in this population, uh, and to, to test out the treatment protocol. So it was a very simple study just to look at their PTSD severity before and after treatment. Um, so they were treated with either exposure therapy or treatment as usual, which in this case meant uh, over the six weeks of treatment that they were contacted once by a case manager or a psychiatrist, which was his usual care in that treatment, in that clinic. To be in the study, uh, men had to be at least 55. It's a very young cutoff for older adults, admittedly, but that was because we wanted to capture all the Vietnam era veterans, uh, and at that time uh, they, were, they were younger. Um, they'd have chronic PTSD. Uh, they couldn't be in another treatment for PTSD because then we wouldn't be able to tell what was, what was changing what um, and kind of other standard inclusion and exclusion criteria for PTSD studies. Uh, so they were recruited. We had 11 people sign up uh, for the exposure therapy. Uh, 53 people were in the treatment as usual uh, comparison group. Uh, and the PE data from the eight veterans who completed treatment. So three people did not complete treatment. Uh, for a few different reasons, and that's uh, a rate of 27%, which is usual for PTSD studies. Um, and you can see in terms of age, education, uh, uh, marriage, uh, st marital status, uh, these folks are about the same. Slightly more uh, Caucasians in the, in the prolonged exposure therapy group. 
Uh, and the most striking uh, data, I think, are the, the bottom level there, that on average, people had been suffering from PTSD for about four decades, um, it, which is just awful to think about. And, and one of the cruel things about PTSD is that by virtue of avoidance, um, many of my veterans avoid people altogether. They don't want to be aggressive towards people. They don't want to be um, uh, triggered in terms of their memories by people. So they just avoid people, and, uh, and their suffering continues, unfortunately. Here, here's a sample of, of a few of the folks that I worked with. Uh, one older man uh, witnessed his friends being killed in Vietnam, and while I was treating him, his son was deployed to Fallujah in Iraq which really upped his symptoms, as you can imagine. He was really concerned about his son. Uh, another man saw civilians killed by the napalm that he was dropping from his plane, uh, so he was traumatized by that. Uh, another older man was seriously injured in Vietnam, uh, really close to death for months in the hospital, and yet felt really ser serious uh, survivor guilt. Felt like he should be back out there in the field uh, uh, keeping his buddy safe, even though he had almost died. A really common comment was, I have too much time on my, uh, on my hands since I'm not working. And, and many of these uh, gentlemen would go out and work 70 or 80 hours a week just to keep themselves distracted and occupied so they wouldn't have to think about these uh, awful events. Uh, so we, we assessed them for PTSD in a variety of ways and, and other things too. Um, they had six weeks, which was 12 sessions, uh, two sessions a week of either, uh, of either treatment and then they uh, filled out uh, more questionnaires at the end. So prolonged exposure therapy specifically, uh, it's been around for a long time, and again, it's well established. The theory is that uh, many people who experience traumatic events will look like they have PTSD in the early months. That's very common. So rates are uh, you know, upwards of 70% depending on the traumatic event. However, within three or four months, most people uh, come down uh, in terms of their symptoms so they don't meet criteria for PTSD anymore. And so after most events, uh, only 25 or 30% people, uh, percent of people will still meet criteria for PTSD. Uh, the reason for that is the people who, who tend to develop PTSD are people who avoid more ironically. Uh, and, and the way I explain it to my veterans is it's, it's a, this weird thing because in life, if you touch a hot stove, for example, uh, you learn really quickly not to touch that hot stove again. You avoid it. Uh, however, if, if it's these really uh, troubling thoughts, the more you push them away, the stronger they come back in terms of your nightmares, intrusive thoughts, flashbacks. It's, it's an, an ironic process is what we call it in psychology. Um, so it doesn't work very well to avoid people, places, thoughts, feelings. Secondly, they have unhelpful thoughts about themselves and about the world. So they think things like, I can't ever do anything right. I can never trust anyone. The world is not a, a safe place ever. Uh, these kind of absolute uh, kinds of thoughts. So the treatment is to have planned extended contact with the memories uh, and with the situations to decrease the physiological response, uh, which is called habituation. And so the idea is that think of the scariest movie that you've ever seen in your life. Um, and imagine watching it, but then imagine watching it dozens of times. After a while, it would not be so scary. Can you all imagine that? Uh, it, it gets less scary over time, and after a while, even, even a scary movie like that, after a while you'd start to notice things like really bad acting, or uh, the props that are used, or these kind of incidental things, because you, you get less compelled by the fear that you were feeling before. And that's true for memories, too. Even though they really happened, uh, they are memories. And the, the more you think about them, actually, your, your arousal goes down. And it lasts over years you know, when we do this treatment. So we did uh, six weeks of twice weekly uh, sessions, 90 minute one-on-one -on -one sessions. Uh, and they did homework too, which was mostly going out into the world and doing things they were afraid of doing, like going to the ballpark, going to the zoo with the grand their grandkids, um, going to a mov movie theater, things like that. And here's the result. I just uh, included one slide here, uh, but, but this slide is really striking. The take home message here is that folks came in with very high rates of PTSD. You see I, wrote, I drew that line at 60. 60 and above is considered clinically significant PTSD. That's, that's really fairly serious uh, levels of PTSD. So you can see on, in both groups when they came in, they had very high rates of PTSD. Uh, and when they finished, the uh, prolonged exposure group had a, a huge decline in, in uh, PTSD severity. The treatment as usual group had some decline, and both were statistically significant because the treatment as usual group was so much bigger. So even though it was a smaller decline, they, they found some benefit too. Uh, and I was actually one of the assessors on that project just to see how people were doing. 
Uh, and what was interesting is all I did in that project was assess people, just talk to them about their PTSD symptoms. And afterwards, I would get calls from them. I got cards from these guys. I only met with them two or three times. They would say, thank you so much for listening to me and your support. And like, Literally, all I did was ask them about their PTSD symptoms. So I think that's really striking all by itself. Even more striking is the rate of decline in the, in the exposure condition. And this is self-reported PTSD. The other one is clinician-rated PTSD, a clinician that doesn't know the uh, which condition they were in, and this is self-reported PTSD, which went down nicely over, over the course of treatment. Uh, so there are some indications that older veterans can uh, be recruited uh, and that they can tolerate uh, exposure therapy, and in fact, uh, they can see great improvements from that. Uh, of course, this is a tiny study. This was only 11 people, eight, eight completers, so we have to be very cautious about interpreting that, um, which will lead me to another study here in a moment. Uh, we also did a meta-analysis a few years ago where we looked at all the behavioral treatments for all of the anxiety disorders among older adults. Uh, and again, there were no studies of, uh, of PTSD or of um, obsessive compulsive disorder that had at least five people in the study at that time. Um, and what was striking is that we found relaxation training actually did really well. Uh, compared to, to the standard care, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. And I'm a CBT guy. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy is great. Uh, but in this, in this study of all these other studies, we found that relaxation training did really well for these older adults with anxiety disorders. So that was good to hear. Um, the other issue that I'm really interested in is cognitive impairment and how cognitive impairment might influence treatment outcomes. So especially for these psychotherapies that are based on learning new skills and remembering to use those new skills, uh, you, it, it would seem that you'd have to be able to learn things and remember them uh, well to, to benefit from the treatment. Uh, one of the things we know is that uh, among those with PTSD, uh, among veterans with PTSD, uh, they have about twice the rate of dementia as those without PTSD. Uh, this is a, a relatively newer area of research, but it's been found in several studies. This is the biggest study. Um, and um, we also found that PTSD is associated with cognitive impairment, even in the absence of clinical dementia. Uh, and so we, we recommended that, that people assess traumatic events uh, with all older, older adults who are coming in. Uh, again, by virtue of PTSD, people aren't going to volunteer this information. People aren't going to say, oh, I was sexually assaulted, or I saw the most awful things in combat. Let me tell you about that. Uh, so it's important that as providers, we assess these things. We ask them. So this is the, the second study, which we just wrapped up. And so I'm not going to show you data here, but I will, I will tell you about the data here. Um, and so this was uh, funded by the VA, and it was a five-year trial of, uh, again, older males, uh, veter veterans with uh, PTSD, and uh, independent clinical assessments again, uh, and neuropsych testing. And so we wanted to see if their cognitive functioning mattered. Uh, and so we collected data on 87 veterans, and again, I don't have the results up here uh, because they're so new. But what we found was that relaxation training helped a lot for veterans with PTSD. So a significant change in their scores. Uh, prolonged exposure therapy helped even more. It did even better. So that, that's great. I and mean, it's great that we have two uh, good options for, for older adults. In the next uh, set of analyses we're going to do is see if cognitive functioning matters in terms of outcomes. And that, I'll shift gears now to talk about telemental health, which is another area of, uh, of interest of mine, which is an idea of using technology to uh, assist communication in terms of mental health. Um, this is a map of uh, rurality in the United States, and you can see that uh, the red uh, dots there are urban centers, the cities. Uh, there we are down there um, in Southern California. Uh, everywhere else is, is a rural setting, and you can see the definition down here. So, so these are um, areas where there are not very many people. Um, and this is our uh, veteran population, and you can see here that uh, well over a third of our veterans live in these rural uh, 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 areas. Um, and that's important for a, a variety of reasons. Uh, the biggest one is that it's hard for them to get care uh, directly uh, as you can do in the city. So telemental health refers to behavioral health services that are provided using communication technology, as I said. Uh, you can do that through telephone, uh, interactive monitoring, uh, personal data assistance, which are kind of outmoded these days, computers, video conferencing links, which is what I'll be talking about. Uh, again, many veterans who live in rural settings don't have access to these empirically supported treatments, these, these treatments that have been shown through data, through research, to, to be good. 
Uh, a lot of the veterans coming back don't have a lot of time. They're trying to raise their families. They're trying to go work. Uh, they're trying to go to college. And they can't afford gas, which is still hovering at $4 a gallon. So it's hard for them to drive out from El Centro, for example, two hours each way uh, to get here in San Diego where we have all the great hospitals that we do. Um, older veterans might have physical impairments that can also interfere with transportation or limit their transportation. Uh, veterans with PTSD might avoid driving. I've worked with many veterans who, who have come back from Iraq and Afghanistan who have given up driving altogether because they acquired a phobia about driving because of all the roadside bombs in Iraq especially. Uh, a lot of veterans with PTSD don't like crowds. So they don't like coming to these major hospitals or, or places like this campus. Um, and some of them don't trust government institutions for their treatment. So if we can provide them care in other places, that's probably a good thing. Uh, so they might have better access through video conferencing. And for video conferencing, think about things. There, there's uh, free uh, software out there like Skype or FaceTime uh, that allow you to communicate uh, and see the other person on the, on the other side. So here's an example of one of our units that we use. And here's another example. So the difference between the equipment that we use and, and the stuff that you can get for free is that the quality is a little bit better, but especially the encryption is really good. So if tr somebody tried to intercept this, they wouldn't be able to interpret it. Uh, so even if they captured the data stream, they wouldn't be able to do anything with it. So that's really important, of course, for the work that we're doing. Uh, and another uh, study that, that, uh, that is ongoing, actually, we, ha we have almost 200 people in this study now. Uh, so those, that uh, data is a little bit outdated. Uh, we're, we're comparing face-to-face uh, -face treatment with uh, video conferencing treatment for these veterans who have PTSD. These folks are all ages, all combat eras, men and women, all trauma types. Um, and we're going to see if there's any difference. And again, we're doing neuropsychological testing to compare. Um, uh, another trial, which we just finished, uh, and again, uh, we're, we're just looking at the results. Um, is uh, the, the same idea except it's a different treatment. So this first one here is a prolonged exposure, which you heard about earlier. This one is cognitive processing therapy, which is more about attacking the thoughts directly. So monitoring the thoughts and then changing thoughts to be more beneficial. Uh, and so we'll have data from those soon. Uh, post-traumatic growth I mentioned earlier. And uh, post-traumatic growth is psycholo uh, positive psychological change that can result uh, from uh, stressful or traumatic uh, circumstances. And uh, some studies have found between 30 and 90 percent of people who have experienced these traumatic events or stressful events have had positive change. So there's been a lot of interest in post-traumatic growth, um, although we, we've had some concerns about the psychometrics of the primary measure that's used. But it's, it's still an interesting concept. Um, again, the definition is, is mixed, but uh, tends to resolve around these things. So that includes relating to others, so people will say, since I experienced this, I actually feel closer to, to my loved ones, or I feel like I can relate better to people at a fundamental level. Uh, I feel like there's new possibilities in life. It's made me take a look at my life and think about what options I have. Uh, personal strength, so realizing I could get through something like that uh, was a shock to me. I feel like I can master other things, too. Uh, spiritual change, so feeling spiritual growth as a result of this, feeling more connection. Uh, and appreciation of life in general, so valuing life after surviving something. So there's some evidence that older adults uh, who lose a spouse report greater awareness of their own strengths, more self-confidence, and more willingness to try new experiences. Uh, surviving women generally report more growth and more self-esteem following a loss of their husband, uh, whereas surviving men report lower self-esteem, which is interesting. Um, and, and this is consistent with other uh, studies of men and women who, who are married to each other. Um, uh, positive or negative social interactions can predict levels of post-traumatic growth among older adults also who have heart disease or who have, again, lost a partner. Um, vicarious growth is another area that's um, studied alongside vicarious trauma. Um, and so uh, there have been studies of, of uh, vicarious growth uh, from women who are partnered with people with PTSD. Um, this one big study after this uh, earthquake in China found that the rate of PTSD was about 57 percent, the rate of post-traumatic growth was about 51 percent, and the predictors of post-traumatic growth were being younger, uh, being female, being better educated, and having higher PTSD symptoms, which is interesting. So people with higher PTSD had higher post-traumatic growth. Um, among older survivors of an oil rig disaster, uh, post-traumatic growth and PTSD were positively correlated. Again, so, so they go together, at least in, in these studies. 
there's evidence that uh, there's post-traumatic growth among Holocaust survivors, uh, older um, uh, former prisoners of war, um, and again, positively correlated with PTSD. That's not always the case, and what we find most often in studies is an inverted U relationship. So that if somebody has low levels of PTSD, they're, they're gonna have low levels of post-traumatic growth. Uh, and if they have really high levels of PTSD, uh, they're gonna have low levels of post-traumatic growth. But at the top of the curve, people with moderate PTSD are more likely to have the highest rates of post-traumatic growth. That's what we usually find, this inverted U, an upside-down U. Um, it, but again, there's, there hasn't been consistent evidence of that. People have found different things. Uh, almost no studies have focused on older adults. And so we did. We, we looked at data from 181 adults age 60 or older across my three randomized control trials. And we predicted this inverted U um, uh, pattern. What we found was no, uh, no relationship between PTSD and post-traumatic growth among the older veterans in our studies which is interesting. Uh, the, the, as you can see here, this is just a, a pure scatter. Um, and so that's interesting. So there might be something different about older adults or about older veterans that we haven't uh, detected before. So there's some evidence, uh, certainly, that perceptions of uh, PTSD or post-traumatic growth can be enhanced with psychotherapy in general. Uh, so we looked at data from our um, cognitive processing therapy study to see if there were differences in PTSD and post-traumatic growth uh, among the veterans who were treated, so before treatment and after treatment. And here's what we found, which was really interesting to me at least. Uh, the rates of PTSD were highest for the younger folks, and they came down nicely over time after they were treated. Uh, the rates of PTSD were lower uh, among older adults, which is what we would predict based on the data that I showed you earlier. Uh, but here's the most striking thing. The younger adults had a, a nice increase in post-traumatic growth after treatment. So they actually said, oh yeah, I can see, uh, I, I had spiritual growth after this, I had this more connection to others. The older adults in these studies had a decrease in post-traumatic growth uh, following treatment, which I'm not sure what that's about. Uh, and so we're gonna take a closer look at the data and see if we can figure, uh, figure out what that's about. Um, there are, uh, again, preliminary data to suggest that uh, older adults can benefit from treatments. Uh, which suggests that for all of us, if you go through a traumatic event, it can be beneficial, at least uh, under the guidance of a therapist, uh, to talk about the traumatic memory with someone, maybe to write about the traumatic memory. There's evidence of benefit from that, too. Uh, and uh, going out and doing uh, feared but safe activities, especially social activities. Uh, video conferencing psychotherapy might be an effective modality of treatment, uh, especially for older adults who can't come into these urban centers. The relationship between PTSD and post-traumatic growth uh, among older adults remains unclear, uh, but our data suggests that there's little correlation uh, for our older veteran population. Uh, and consistent with other research, older veterans had lower rates of PTSD both before and after treatment, um, and the rate of decline was similar for older and younger adults. Again, younger veterans uh, had an improvement in post-traumatic growth and older adults didn't. Um, and I, I want to be cautious here. Post-traumatic growth is reported by some uh, individuals who have gone through a traumatic event. This doesn't mean that everyone who's, who goes through a traumatic event should expect post-traumatic growth. Uh, it's certainly not universal. Um, and it, what I really want to caution people about is to, to expect that from anybody who's been through a traumatic event. We, we don't want to assume that people have had this, uh, these benefits uh, because many of the, the veterans that I work with have not had any uh, clear benefits from the events that they experienced. Thank you very much. And I think we have uh, time for uh, questions tonight, so uh, I'll, I'll start up here. That's a good question. So the question is, to be in, in these studies, people had to be on a stable dose of medication. So if they've been on the same dose of medications for two months or more, or three months or more, depending on the study, um, they could come into the study. We just wanted to make sure it wasn't the medications causing the changes. Uh, and so, uh, and, and many of uh, the veterans in the study were taking medication, but they were on these stable doses usually for years uh, and still had PTSD. Um, and th there was the one smaller study, that was the limitation there was me, because it was me mostly doing um, different aspects of the trial. Uh, for the larger trial, actually, it was quite easy to recruit. We, we got uh, the, the 87 uh, older men coming in that trial. Um, so, so quite successful, even given the inclusion and exclusion criteria that we had. Uh, and I'll tell you, you know, you know uh, we pay uh, subjects to come in for treatment, but rarely did that have anything to do with them taking part. What had, had a lot to do with them coming in and participating was that their PTSD was awful, 
uh, and that had been awful for decades, usually. And, uh, and oftentimes it wasn't them saying, oh yeah, let me go get treatment all of a sudden. It, usually it was their partner, their girlfriend or their wife in this case, because these were men, uh, pushing them into treatment, saying this, this is too much. Many of the older adults that I worked with, these older men, um, had had a worsening of their symptoms in recent years, and we found that in the, in the research more broadly too, that there's an exacerbation of their PTSD symptoms. Again, we think uh, there's a few reasons for that. One is that they have an empty nest, they're not as busy with work, they've had loss, uh, but also physiological, there, physiologically there might be changes. Uh, for example, uh, they're not able to distract themselves as well uh, cognitively as they were when they were younger. And so that might have caught up with them and now they just can't uh, tolerate the symptoms as much. So, so a lot of the veterans were, were uh, very willing to come in even if they needed a little nudge. Uh, perhaps even a bigger reason was that for these older veterans, they wanted to help the younger veterans and, their, and the people in their cohort, their, their uh, other older adults. Uh, so, so they came in and they said, I don't care what happens with me so much, uh, and I certainly don't care about the money. I, I heard this from many veterans. I want to, to help figure out how to treat this. Uh, so the, the two big elements of exposure therapy are to talk about it. So they, and again, they would narrate the event in as much detail as they could over and over and over again. And they would choose the worst event out of many, usually. Uh, so that was one element. And the other element was to go out and do stuff. And it was doing stuff that they had avoided doing since, since being traumatized, usually in late teens or early 20s. Um, and so they would go out and do these things. And so if they uh, had any interest or past interest or potential interest in things like expressive arts, it, certainly we encourage them to do that. And many of them do. So many of them start writing for the first time, or they take up dance or music or other art, uh, which is, of course, incredibly powerful. And especially if it's a social thing, like a weekly class or something, we, we love things like that. So again, even though it's not explicit, it's not a mandate of the treatment, it's often um, concurrent with the treatment. But, but the point you make is a really good one, which is uh, do we ever use expressive arts to, um, to bring about these feelings to help, um, to help uh, define the memory a little bit more? And certainly that, that's a, a great idea to do that explicitly again. Um, most veterans, I'll tell you, they come in and I ask them a few questions about this, and even though they don't want to talk about it, they're willing to, and it's amazing. Uh, the memory is as fresh as yesterday. I mean, they start talking about it and they have more detail literally than I could tell you about the lunch that I had a few days ago, right? I mean, they, they can tell you every little detail, even though they've done their darndest not to think about it for 40 years. Uh, however, uh, um, not everybody can do that and the treatment doesn't work for everybody. In general, it works for about 70 to 80% of people who come through this treatment, which is great, but it's not everybody. And so for some folks, it might be good to have different uh, forms of, of stimulation. That's a great question. Yeah, so this is a great, great comment. Uh, and, and the comment is, um, so uh, experiencing something like a, a, an automobile accident, um, it can keep triggering you for, again, for years. And, and we've got plenty of evidence that this can happen for years. Uh, and that's the case for bereavement too. And certainly there are many people who have lost their loved ones and keep getting reminded of it. So, so what I love about the question is it, um, it highlights a, a big question that we have as, as researchers in the field, uh, and that is, is the best approach to try to remove someone from all the triggers, to, to keep them away from all the stimuli that are out there, or is the best approach to do the opposite, to expose them to all the stimuli that are out there? Um, and I, the, the data support that the latter in general, so it's a better idea not to avoid in general, as I said, uh, even if you distract yourself a lot, sometimes you won't be. You'll hear a horn honking or you hear something else. You have to get in the car. You've got to travel sometimes. So by virtue of that, it might be better to, uh, to put away the book, the reading materials, and to, to sit in the car and be there. And I've had the same experience. I was in a car accident, and for a long time, I was really scared to be a passenger. For a long time, I was really scared to be in a car at night. Now, these things aren't uh, inherently risky, really. I mean, the rates of car accidents, of course, are, are high, but not that high. Um, and being a passenger isn't inherently riskier than being a driver. Being nighttime isn't inherently riskier in general, that the rates aren't that high. Um, but there are all these things get, that get pulled into the memory that feel like they're dangerous even when they're not. And the only way to unlearn that, to decondition yourself from that, is to be around the stimuli in a safe environment and not have something bad happen over and over again, which is what we have our veterans do. So we have them go, so, so if we were working on this, uh, I would have a veteran go into the car day after day after day. And we start small, so we would start with having them just sit in the car in the driveway without the motor even on, and then eventually turn the motor on, and eventually cruise around the neighborhood just on the surface streets. So you build up to it, which is what we do in the treatment.
Uh, but it's a, a great question. And I have some uh, uh, individuals that I work with that really don't need to be exposed to the events. And, and you know, once in a while I'll be working with a sexual assault survivor and she'll say, okay, you know, what I think I need to do is uh, every time a, a TV show comes on or a movie is on and it shows any kind of rape or sexual assault, I have to leave the room and it's embarrassing because my friends are there. Uh, and so what I need to do is watch these shows and, and watch those scenes especially. And sometimes that makes sense because sometimes they want to be able to stay through the whole movie even if their friends are watching it. Other times it doesn't make sense. And certainly none of us ever will get to the point where we feel comfortable watching those scenes. That, that's not the point. The point is for somebody to be able to go out and live their life and do what they need to do. So like driving a car you probably need to do like coming here tonight. Um, and so if you, can, if you can distract successfully, um, that's great. But a lot of times it works in the short term really well, just like benzodiazepines and other kind of distractions. But in the long term, it doesn't work to decondition you. So that's a, that's a very good question. That's a good point. Yes. So the question is, uh, with flashbacks, do we know ways to prevent flashbacks specifically from happening? Um, and, and we haven't studied that specifically. We have looked at the rates of flashbacks before and after treatment, and they come down uh, after these treatments. Um, now, what, what I would say, now there, there are things like flashbacks that sometimes, and this is true of panic attacks too, sometimes they seem like they're totally out of the blue, like they just hit me for no apparent reason. But I'll say that in most times, if we really um, work with a person and track through every moment leading up to that and everything that happened after that, they're like, oh yeah, now that I think about it, there was, uh, you know, I was in the store and there was a song on overhead and that song was uh, Paint It Black. Or this, that song was something else that, that was playing on the radio and that reminds me of the crash. Um, or um, somebody was wearing a perfume. Or somebody, uh, you know, slammed their car door. So usually they can identify some stimulus, some trigger that set it off, but not always. Uh, and it's a great question. It's something that we don't know specifically how to address that. Generally, we do. G generally, these treatments work really well for reducing flashbacks in addition to other really triggers. Work on that. Yes, yes, so th that might be the future grant. Thank you. So the question is, what rate of uh, widowers or widows uh, get uh, PTSD from losing their loved one? And uh, there's a whole uh, area of research uh, that's looking at traumatic grief specifically. So not just um, general grief, which we all expect and which is really normal, of course, when you lose a loved one, but that there's something complicated about it. The definition has uh, shifted uh, over the years uh, and the treatments uh, shift accordingly. But generally the rates are um, you know, in the five to 10% range. Uh, and not as high as some of these other uh, events that you saw, certainly sexual assault or, or combat, but still quite significant. Uh, and I can tell you I've worked with many people who have had, uh, whether it's called complicated uh, or traumatic grief or not, uh, uh, you know, they've had grief for years that's really interfered with their lives, uh, which, which can make a lot of sense. It, now, in terms of our treatments, a lot of the treatments are along these same lines, um, which, uh, which are exposure-based. So uh, there's a tendency for people, when they have traumatic grief, to avoid anything to do with the loved one who they lost, uh, maybe throw away all the clothes and any reminders, and when people bring it up, to not want to talk about it. Uh, so we would recommend actually the opposite, and we, we work with the person to find ways to honor their loved one and to think about their loved one on purpose, even though it's, it's hard to do. Um, the more you do it, like anything else, the easier it gets to do. Um, so that's what we do. It's a good question. Sure. Yes. The question is, um, if people don't see improvement, or if not everyone sees improvement, uh, why should they get treatment? And related to that is, isn't uh, sadness as the result of loss, isn't that normal? Isn't that sometimes beautiful to see? And, and again, a way of honoring the, the, the loved one that you lost. Uh, and I agree with you about a lot of that. You know, I've been married 10 years and I cannot imagine losing my wife. A lot of the veterans I work with have been married for 40 or, or more years. I, I really cannot imagine it. I, you know, I, I can't imagine her being away for a couple of days, much less uh, uh, dying. I found out that I've been 63 years. 63 years, uh, fantastic. Con congratulations, 63 years. That's fantastic, really, that's wonderful. <laughs> fantastic. Uh, the, other, um, the other point I'll make is in terms of the guilt, and, and your um, attitude about guilt is different than a lot of the people that I work with. Your, your attitude about uh, surviving this, in some ways, almost randomly, right? You were able to suppress the sneeze, but we're not always, always, always able to do that, uh, and it saved your life. Uh, other people, other men that, that you were uh, serving with died, right? Uh, and you're saying, you know, this is life. I don't feel intense survivor guilt. I didn't cause it. Uh, 
I'll, I'll tell you a lot of the veterans that I work with who have PTSD, part of their PTSD is they feel intense guilt. They feel I equivalent to causing it. And actually, if you ask them, they'll say, I'm 80, 90, 100% responsible for that, even though somebody else killed them. So that's a difference in, in your attitude uh, and a lot of the folks that I work with. Now, now most importantly here, I, I want to clarify something. So this graph is about post-traumatic growth, which, which is that idea of, of um, feeling more spiritual connection, feeling better about your relationships, valuing life more. So here we saw that uh, before and after treatment, younger adults had an improvement in that. Uh, older adults actually had a, a little bit of decrease in that, and we don't know why that is. But that's just that one element. Now for PTSD, which is what they came here for, uh, older adults did beautifully. Older adults did just as well as younger adults. They came in with a lower rate of PTSD and they left with a lower rate of PTSD than the younger adults. So, so that's why a lot of folks uh, come in for treatment is because uh, it works well for most folks. Now, but I'll tell you, if somebody came in with bereavement or complicated grief or traumatic grief, uh, and they wanted to see me, I, I would send them to a colleague who actually specializes in that, uh, Dr. Sid Zizek, who, who works here, who's fantastic, uh, one of the world experts in, in bereavement and complicated grief. So I wouldn't, uh, I, I'd send them elsewhere. But in general, uh, treatments for PTSD work well for older adults as far as we can tell. Now these two studies that I presented uh, are, are two of the only studies on older adults with PTSD. So, so take it with a grain of salt, but it's promising. <laughs> If you have PTSD, it's much more likely that you're going to have a whole host of diseases or, or medical conditions. They go hand in hand for a, a lot of reasons, uh, some of which we just don't understand fully. Uh, but, but one of those reasons is probably, again, if you think if you're on guard all the time, what that's like for your physiology. To have your adrenaline rushing all the time is not the way we're built. We're not built and we're not designed that way. So that's, that's not good for our body systems. So PTSD is not good for you physically. We, we know that. That's been uh, well established. Um, and again, the rates of dementia are higher. There, there's lots of complications. In terms of uh, people who have had uh, loved ones die and then die soon after, that's also very well established that that happens. Um, and and there's, there's a variety of reasons for that. Some could be environmental, that they shared uh, habits in terms of what they did. But certainly, uh, losing a loved one is, is the biggest stressor there is, or one of the biggest stressors there is. Um, and so it can lead to PTSD or depression or a variety of other things that can also complicate medical conditions. So, so those things are well, well shown. I wouldn't say it's proof necessarily, but they're well shown. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much. Thanks all for coming out tonight.